suck with corn. Admit it. Go on, admit it. And today, I'm going to tell you why. Do you leave enough skulls at the Skull Throne? Do you spill enough blood for Carneth? Well, don't worry. Bloodfather Blake is going to look after you, and today we'll be diving deep into why you suck with corn in Immortal Empires. After today, your corn campaigns will no longer be forlorn. As a disclaimer, this is not a guide for multiplayer. It would take more than a God of War's acuity on the battlefield to explain why you're terrible at that. My name is Blake and I bid you my fondest welcome to Blake's Takes, where today I'll be giving you my take on why you're just awful with corn. Is my take hot or not? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoy today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Now, let's charge headfirst into the carnage and embrace the Crimson Spectacle. There are skulls to pile up and blood to flow. Let's jump right into this video. Reason you suck with corn, number one. You don't know how to use Scarbrand on the battlefield. Scarbrand, the exalted bloodthirster that was ballsy enough to take a swing at corn himself, is rightly feared as a melee combatant. His extreme speed and damage make him a one-man army, and you can feel safe in the late game knowing that he basically becomes an unkillable god. But do you know how to use him in the early game? Scarbrand is still a force to be reckoned with in the early game, but you can't just send him into battle blindly. No, to get the most out of Scarbrand, you have to think of him as a chariot. You need to keep him moving. Firstly, he is armoured, but not so armoured that he is impervious to missiles. In Warhammer 3, the AI is intelligent enough to focus fire him, which means that he'll quickly become a pincushion if left in a prolonged fight. Scarbrand is a chunky boy and has great mass. Dude, we've been through this, okay? I'm cultivating mass. Stop saying that. You are not cultivating mass. And if you are, stop cultivating and start harvesting. Bro. So he can easily push his way out of blobs of infantry and even cavalry. Scarbrand is also faster than a lot of cavalry units, but you should try and equip him with a banner of swiftness as soon as possible to make him even faster. I'm fast as f boy. Still fast as f boy. Come get some. <laughs> Secondly, Scarbrand has one of the highest charge bonuses in the game. It is foolish to waste it. It increases his melee attack and weapon damage to gargantuan amounts, and it is the primary reason why we'll often send him after the enemy's lord the first chance I can get. Use Rage Embodied to keep the enemy's lord close to you, as they go on a rampage and they will lose control of their character, giving Scarbrand plenty of opportunity to do his bloody work. Thirdly, when Scarbrand charges, he activates collision attacks. These attacks are basically the equivalent of chariots attacking, using their mass and speed as a weapon instead of actually striking a foe. Scarbrand's collision attacks can churn a bloody swathe through enemy units. This can be a bit tricky to activate, but simply all you need to do is to attack units that are behind other units. Scarbrand's charge animation to the rear unit will par through the unit in front of it, causing obscene levels of damage. I don't know whether this is intentional or is a bug, but it's extremely satisfying to get a good one of these off and watch the enemies turn into a fine red mist in front of you. Remember, if you're lazy with Scarbrand and just send him into a blob of infantry, he'll likely beat it, but he is capable of so much more. Scarbrand is best used as a hit and run entity, if you micro him well, he has the mass to push out of fights and then the speed to quickly loop back round for another huge charge attack. To aid with this, try and equip him with the Banner of Swiftness as soon as you find one. It massively increases his speed and acceleration, making him able to get out of sticky situations and get himself into juicier targets. Utilise the collision attacks he can unleash by getting him to charge through bunched up infantry formations by attacking units that are just behind them. As a bonus, 
These collision attacks also register kills for your axes, slaughter and carnage, making your weapon strength even greater and your single target killing power that much stronger. As you can see from the video above, Scarbrand is taking on two full armies by himself. Quite comfortably, I may add. Use him as a hit and run piece like this, and you can comfortably do so as well. Reason you suck with corn. Number two, you don't know how to level up Scarbrand. Scarbrand is absurdly powerful. If you use him as I described in Reason 1, you can use him to effectively solo armies. He's so powerful, in fact, that you should focus on getting him more utility on the overworld campaign map to balance him out. You should be looking to maximise his blue line skills as quickly as possible. This will give his army extra replenishment rate to keep your rampage going for longer. All Cornate armies can replenish in enemy territory without encamping, so the blue line buffs giving you extra replenishment rate are extremely efficient and synergize nicely with this ability. As the vast majority of your army is melee orientated, you are inevitably going to take casualties. Corn approves of this, as it does not matter whose blood is spilt, just that it is, but you'll want to be able to get fresh blood into your next battles. Focus on the blue line first, then Scarbrand's unique line, then you can either focus on upgrading his soldiers or Scarbrand himself. I personally prefer going with the yellow line skills and turning Scarbrand into a raid boss. This kind of thinking also ties in with your other lords. Personally, I prefer the Heralds of Corn over the Chaos Lord as they get access to buffed replenishment rate faster in the blue line of skills, and I think their red line of skills offer better stat boosts to their troops. Other than that, both lord choices outside of Scarbrand are quite similar. When they've ascended to a Demon Prince or an Exalted Bloodthirster, they both have a very similar role on the battlefield, a flying, fighty, melee lord. But Demon Princes and Exalted Bloodthirsters have nowhere near the battle impact that Scarbrand has, so I focus on their red line of skills to buff the rest of their troops after I've completed the blue line tree. Their trouble is that they lack the mass that Scarbrand has, so they find it very difficult to disengage from fights, so it's very easy for your lords to become bogged down and killed. Be careful of this. Remember, the blue line skills for casualty replenishment rate are extremely useful on Scarbrand and your other lords. It synergizes perfectly with your ability to replenish everywhere without having to encamp. Make sure to pick these up ASAP to help your rampage last longer. Also, Lightning Strike will pay dividends later in your campaign, as you will be likely rampaging through far-flung territories with little support other than the occasional Bloodhost army. It's good to be able to divide blobs of armies up into more manageable chunks. Divide and conquer, if you will. Upkeep reduction for your units and more campaign movement range are also great bonuses, which you'll find along this tech line, so make sure to prioritise it. Reason you suck with corn? Number 3. You don't know how to manage your settlements. As a representative of the Blood God on this mortal plane, you're not really in the habit of erecting settlements, in the traditional sense. You do not trade, you do not create things, your goal is to destroy things. So don't get frustrated when you notice your settlements are crap and are making you very little money. There is but one surefire way for your cornate settlements to thrive. Creating things does not appease Karneth. Maiming, killing and burning things does. However, you will need a place to act as a conduit for your operations while you go about the Lord of Rage's bidding. To reliably recruit and access your high tier troops, you will need to get at least one settlement grown to tier 5. You cannot grow the population of your settlements 
by normal means, like building farms as those less belligerent races than you do. No, the only way to grow your population is by murder. You'll notice that every army you have has this red bloodletting meter featured here. By killing things, this bar increases, and with it, faction-wide growth bonuses. Blood hosts also increase growth with the bloodletting ability, so make sure to get them fighting things as quickly as possible to make the most out of the worldwide growth bonuses. It's the only way to establish growth for your settlements, and this means you should be doing a lot of killing. Now you may hear some guides say that you should push into the mountains to the east or the wasteland to the north for the suitable climate bonus to your settlements. They say that you should avoid areas with unsuitable climates such as deserts because you should be looking for optimal territory to control. They look down upon my early invasion of the deserts of Araby and Khemri with mocking disdain. To them, I say, The desert takes the weak. My desert. My Arrakis. My doom. It's not about the climate. It's about sending a message. Everything burns, but truth be told, it doesn't really matter which way you go. Just make sure the blood flows. I like plundering the desert because it's got a wealth of enemies to fight. It's a target-rich environment, and if you plunder your way down to the bottom of the jungles fast enough, you have the chance to meet a super-secret friend at the bottom of the map. More on them later. You just need one settlement at Tier 5 to act as a recruiting hub for your top-tier units. You need to try and get there as quickly as possible by getting armies up to full bloodletting for the population growth bonuses. As your armies will be fighting around the world, you'll be relying on global recruitment to be filling your armies. If you take casualties or you want to replace units with stronger counterparts, bloodletting also provides bonus to this as well and shaves a few turns off of your global recruiting time so I highly advise fighting a few battles first, if you can, before attempting to recruit new units. If I take a settlement, I normally only put down the War Amphitheatre that increases battle loot for adjacent provinces, and the Trophy Racks to reduce enemy leadership and also add a multiplier onto my income. These are somewhat quasi-income buildings, but that's basically it. Your settlements will barely make a dent in covering the costs of your armies, so invest in them sparingly. I declare bankruptcy! Death Gorge will be your flagship city from where you launch your campaign against the world. The rest of your settlements do not matter. Korn does not wish to see a large contiguous land empire. He does not want you to paint the map in anything but the blood of your enemies. Oblige him. Reason you suck with corn. Number four, you don't know the role of your troops. Bloodletters and Chaos Warriors. These happy chappies will forge the backbone of your early game armies. But do you know how to use them? Bloodletters are very strong units if used correctly. They have amazing armor piercing weapon damage and a bonus versus infantry. But as demons, they will instantly die if their leadership breaks, and whilst they have some armour, they are still vulnerable to being wiped out by leadership shocks. And they don't have shields to protect themselves from ranged firepower. Bloodletters are not your frontline unit. That duty goes to Chaos Warriors. Their high armour will protect them from ranged attacks and cavalry charges. As they're mortal, if their morale breaks, then they'll be able to rout as opposed to being wiped out by demonic instability. I like to have a staunch line of Chaos Warriors with shields to take the brunt of charges and ranged attacks, and then have my Bloodletters nestled behind them and to the flanks to come into the battle after the initial charges have been done. Your Bloodletters are the hammer, your Chaos Warriors are the anvil. Your bloodletters are best used against high-value armoured opponents. They have very high armour-piercing weapon strength, which is great for whittling down these kind of enemies. 
your Chaos Warriors lack any serious armor piercing damage values, but they are still no slouch and will do a good bit of damage, but where they really shine is against unarmored opponents. But damage really isn't their role. Their role is to absorb damage, while your damage dealing bloodletters do the majority of the killing, so they're tough, armored and do a lot of damage. What can't they do? I hear you cry. Now Bloodletters and Chaos Warriors are both relatively slow. In every army you should aim to have some fast movers. To balance out the slow moving heavy infantry, you need fast moving units to shut down enemy artillery and ranged units. Flesh Hounds of Corn are exceptional at this role. If you haven't got access to them, Chaos Furies and Warhounds will also do. When you start moving up the technology tree, these can eventually be replaced with Chaos Knights, Minotaurs, Blood Crushers, Skull Crushers, and eventually Bloodthirsters. But I strongly recommend having fast moving contingents in each army to threaten artillery and ranged units. Now, heavy infantry spam armies can work and do perform well in auto resolve, but your primary threats will come from elves, dwarves, and tomb kings. These factions have great range and artillery options, so you need to equip yourself with the correct tools for the job. Otherwise, your slow-moving, heavy infantry will be sitting ducks. If you are fighting these factions and you can't auto-resolve your way out of it, you'll have a very tough time trying to beat them if you just have heavy infantry. So ensure that you have fast-moving units to threaten your enemy's backline units. Your lords, when they have ascended to a demon prince or a bloodthirster, will be able to do this job, but they'll need support. They don't have the sheer killing power and mobility that Scarbrand has. Remember, you don't have magic to rain down on your enemy. You cannot rely on missiles. You need to make sure you use all the tools at your disposal to best the enemy. Reason you suck with corn. Number five you don't make use of Korn's most powerful ability. Blood for the blood god! Blood for the blood god! Blood for the blood god! Yes. Blood for the blood god, indeed. Korn's most powerful ability is the ability to summon an army after raising a settlement in the form of a blood host. By selecting blood for the blood god after successfully winning a siege, the Lord of Murder will grant you an army to spill blood in his name with. Nice. The recruitment of these armies is free, and they do not impact supply lines. They spawn in with no upfront cost, but you do still have to pay upkeep on the units that are fielded, although this is somewhat reduced. This army cannot replenish through any means other than in post-battle options, and if they don't fight, they'll gradually begin to take attrition until they wither away into nothing. You cannot move them between armies as well, they will just die. So why is this so good? Basically, Korn's early game units are solid, but they lack any tactical nuance. Your units will be primarily heavy infantry, Korn warriors or bloodletters. What the Bloodhost army does is it allows you to have a chance to get a few heavy hitters in your arsenal, be that Bloodthirsters or Blood Crushers. These guys offer you some extremely hard hitting and fast units that are typically unavailable to you in the early game. Now, this is random, mind you, so you can end up with three skull cannons, but basically, the more slots or units warped into the Bloodhost, the better likelihood they have of spawning in a good one, like a Bloodthirster. Yeah, he's alright, isn't he? Also, it probably doesn't need to be said, but it's another army. Send it off to sack and raise settlements. You should be using the Bloodhost mechanic often. You can use these armies in the early game to bulldoze your enemies and get a massive head start. You have the chance to get tier 4 and 5 units when your foes are running around with tier 1 and 2 units. Press this advantage early and watch your game snowball out of control. They're also a great time saver. I will always sack settlements to extract favour from them, unless it's an absolute emergency. 
I like having a blood host follow my main army around so that they can raise the settlement over the next turn whilst my main army moves on to a different city to sack. They're like a little cornate cleanup crew, leaving tidy smouldering ruins behind my sacked settlements. The rewards for raising a settlement with either blood for the blood god or skulls for the skull throne are the same whether a settlement has been sacked or not. So you should always sack settlements to gain cash from them before raising them. Now we need to talk about blood hosts of blood hosts. What happens when your blood host army raises a settlement and calls forth another blood host? Well, let me introduce you to the concept of diminishing returns. Diminishing returns, simply put, means the more you input of one thing into another, the less efficient it becomes in terms of output. Now, this happens a lot in real life. For example, you may think it wise to work 14 hour days, 7 days a week, and at first you'll probably get a lot done. But over time, this productivity will wane, until you are nothing more than a bitter husk, painfully aware of your life, slowly slipping through your fingers resentful of the world and the capitalist overlords governing you and your time in the relentless pursuit of profit. You find yourself wishing nothing more than for it to end, for it to all stop, as you slide into the catatonic embrace of daily drinking and Netflix true crime documentaries. And Warhammer mimics this phenomenon with blood hosts. What you'll find in the early game is that if you call a blood host with a blood host army, you'll end up with a small four unit trash stack like this one pictured. This is due to this debuff here. Minus five units on creation is a huge amount in the early game. You can modify this with technologies to get more units so you don't end up with a four stack of blood letters, but in the early game, before you have these technologies, please don't call a blood host with another blood host unless you're desperate for troops. Use Scarbrand or another Lord and you'll get more units of better quality. Later in the game, when you have some technologies researched and Scarbrand's locus of endless war ability unlocked, using blood hosts to call blood hosts is far more viable. But I'd strongly advise against it in the early game, unless you're desperate for forces. Remember that using a Lord to call a blood host will always be more efficient than using a blood host to call a blood host. Now, I've said it before, and I'll no doubt have to say it again, you want to always sack a settlement first to extract favour from it. Always sack first, then either raise the settlement for skulls or a blood host. The skulls or blood host options are not affected by whether the settlement has been damaged in previous battles. You'll still get the same amount of units in your blood host, or the same amount of skulls, you just need to wait a turn for the settlement to replenish. It's always worth sacking settlements as it's your faction's best money-making tool, and a recently sacked settlement does not change what units spawn in the blood host or how many skulls you receive from raising it in the turns afterwards. The only time you should ever be occupying a settlement is if it's a provincial capital, and normally after you've sacked it. You need to raise all other minor settlements to the ground for the blood god, if your cornate corruption is high enough, you will passively begin to occupy these territories as bands of murderers and marauders attracted to your violent tantrums of rage move into the settlements that you've demolished and swear fealty to you. It's free real estate. Occupying minor settlements costs you skulls. Skulls that are better spent on technology or offerings to corn. Wait for minor settlements to be passively captured by your cornate corruption once you own the capital region of a province. Later on in the campaign, where skulls will inevitably be in greater supply, you can sack and occupy settlements with more freedom. But when you're in the early stages of the campaign, I strongly recommend only sacking and occupying major settlements. Sack and then raise the minor ones. I must confess that this is a bit of an art form and will often be dependent on the macro situation surrounding you. Now, the only art form we should be doing as corn is painting the ground with blood, so I've made a handout for this topic, which you can use as a guide for your next corn campaign. There'll be a link for you to download that in the description below. This will cover most of the scenarios which you'll come across in your corn campaigns. 
use it well, and bring utter ruination to this world. Now also remember, you pay upkeep on these blood hosts, so here are a couple of tips to help you manage this. Always ask yourself whether you need the blood host. If it isn't doing anything, or there's nothing to kill nearby, disband it. Has your blood host taken a lot of casualties? You can merge your units to reduce upkeep costs. Is it so badly damaged that it's no longer useful? Disband it. I advise against sending it on a suicide mission into an enemy force. You don't want to be giving your enemy lords any extra gold or experience. If you can't win a battle with them, disband them. You can always summon more by raising another city. Reason you suck with corn. Number 6. You're greedy with your skulls. This is a cardinal sin. You should not be greedy with your skulls. Corn needs skulls just as much as you do, so you should be sharing them. If you press this button here, you'll offer up 2,000 skulls to corn. This gives you more units in your blood hosts, more post-battle loot, and lets you teleport blood letters onto ranged units and artillery teams, as well as earning you the Blood God's favour. It's a very useful ability. I use this often. You actually start off with 5,000 skulls, so you can do this immediately. I like to spam this ability on cooldown. More units in your blood hosts will help you steamroll your opposition even harder in the early game. More post-battle loot will help you pay for your absurdly expensive troops. And dropping a unit of blood letters on an unsuspecting range unit will never not be useful. A nice little bonus is if you've unlocked the Relentless Rage ability. You can drop it on your summoned blood letters as they begin to disintegrate, and this will give you another 20 seconds with them on the battlefield, as their models cannot be killed during this time. Useful if you just need a little bit more damage on that artillery team to get them to break and rout. So, in short, don't be greedy with your skulls. The buffs you get for the skull donation are excellent. There are technologies which make the buff cheaper to use and the buffs more powerful. Make sure to give corn all the skulls a growing blood god needs. Reason you suck with corn. Number 7. You don't engage in diplomacy. Now, this may sound ridiculous. Corn, the lord of war and murder, engage in diplomacy. Blake, what are you smoking and how could I get some? Please, people, lower your pitchforks and hear me out. The Cornate roster is very single focused. Fighty, killy, melee troops. You're limited to one quite bad ranged unit. And that's it. The rest is melee infantry, cavalry and monsters. But what if that wasn't the case? Now, you actually have a natural ally in Clan Moors to the east. You hate the same folks he hates, mainly dwarves and greenskins. And after you've rampaged around a bit, you'll see he is naturally drawn to your angry ways and will often come to you for an alliance. Once you're on good terms with the War Mouse, you can build an outpost in his capital and you can get some Skaven units, or as I like to call them, Auxilarates. Getting a few Poisoned Wind Mortars or Play Claw Catapults in a Cornate army really helps out and offers you far more tactical flexibility, especially in sieges, where your prior tactic would be to rush the gates. Now with a bit of Skaven firepower, you can blow up the enemy from afar. Have Queek be your friend you won't regret it. This isn't mandatory though, you can still kill him and take his lands, but I find leaving him alive so you can get a few Skaven weapons teams into your armies can radically alter the dynamics of how you play. You're no longer forced to rush your enemies blindly, you can play a bit more surgically and force enemies to come to you with your withering artillery fire. Corn cares not from whence the blood flows, only that it flows. If some lowly rats can assist you in this endeavour, then this will surely garner Corn's favour, and this is, in fact, scientifically proven as well. If you take command of an allied army, they will also get a bloodletting meter, showing how much Corn favours this idea. Now, if that's not proof that this is sanctioned by the Axe Father, then I don't know what is. It's also a great way to get growth bonuses if you start grabbing allied armies early. They'll also have the added benefit of not costing you any money. And as you're so cash-strapped, that's quite nice as well. Now, as I alluded to in Reason 3, there is also a super-secret friend at the bottom of the map. 
And that friend is, of course... Kairos Fate Weaver. Now, you want Siege as an ally because the AI will use the changing of the ways on your enemies. You shouldn't recruit any of his units, really, unless you're absolutely desperate. It's purely for his changing of the ways. If you go to war with him, he will then use those changing of the ways on you. Holt faction is extremely devastating if it gets used on you. A whole turn without any murder can see your burgeoning empire crumble into insolvency. Have him use it on your enemies instead. If you'd like to know more about Sinch and his changing of the ways, I made a guide for him which you can peruse at your leisure. I'll leave a link for that in the description. Reason you suck with corn. Number eight. You're not relentlessly aggressive. You are rewarded handsomely for aggression. When Scarbrand wins a battle, he gains campaign movement range and stacks of bloodletting, which give global bonuses. You need to move quickly to the next fight. If you're ever at peace, you're playing corn wrong. Your entire faction should be spilling blood, battling and raising settlements every turn. You will likely be running at a massive economic deficit for the majority of your playthrough. Don't be alarmed, this is natural. Use it as a driving force behind your decision making. This economic necessity to murder things forces you to plan ahead. You must feed the industrial military complex of the Cornate Legions. You must be thinking, where is the next fight and will it be lucrative enough to sustain my economy? When you attack and win as Scarbrand, you gain movement points, which can let you clear out an impressive number of armies, all in one turn. So you should be always actively trying to find the next fight. No enemies to fight near you? Start a new war. Where a lot of people fall down is in the defense of their land empire. You must throw the concept of defense out the window. Similarly to the greenskin methodology I explained in my Skarsnik video, your priority should be sacking and raising settlements, not defending any recent acquisitions. Your default garrisons are terrible, and walls are expensive and don't make them a whole lot better. You don't make much money from your cities, do not try and defend them, they're not a priority. Sacking and raising more settlements is the priority. Owning entire provinces gives faction-wide bonuses to melee attacks through province commandments, which is nice, but not reason enough to stop the carnage. You'll be running at a severe income deficit most of the time you're playing this campaign. You need to be actively searching for more wars to wage to stop going into the red. The only way you can make money is through battles and sacking settlements. Your settlements will barely make enough passive income to cover the cost of an army so it forces you to think very differently. Every turn, you need to try and make sure your forces are fighting battles and bringing in Korn's favour, or economic ruin will befall you. By turn 69, <laughs> I realised I'd completed the long campaign objectives. There's still no event screen for this, so it could have been long before that, but I kept playing, and by turn 123, I had completed the Domination Victory Objectives. Again, by accident. I don't think I've managed to get into such a rhythm with a campaign before. Korn's campaign I find is very thematic and very easy to immerse yourself into. It has a challenging early game, but when you start snowballing, boy do you go out of control. Despite completing all the campaign objectives, I felt compelled to continue, to fully devour this world and wash it away in a rumbling of blood and skulls. I want to see the look on my military allies and vassals' faces when there is no one left to conquer, no more enemies to fight, as I turn on them like a pack of hungry dogs and tear them to shreds for my sustenance. The blood must flow, from who matters not, just that it does. Only when the blood runs in all rivers and the skulls pile high to reach Karneth himself in the Eye of Terror will this world know peace. Because war, war never changes. So, do you agree with my take on why you suck with corn? Let me know in the comments below. 
If you've enjoyed today's video, please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps the channel out. Tune in next time to find out why you suck with Sarina Katarina and her ice cord. I've been Blake, delivering my take. Thank you all so much for watching.